Hello there, and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 357. That's 357 of the Agassino Zinger Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Getting there. Mas o menos, mas o menos, mi amigos, mi amigas. But... If it's your first time watching this show and you like what you hear, you like what you see, click the like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five-star review. That's five, right? And share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, please click the link down below at patreon.com forward slash Agostino. That's A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. That's patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O for one dollar. For little as one dollar a month, you can get access to my entire audio library as well as this gorgeous podcast episode that you listen to right now in full HD, three or four days ahead of everybody else. Why not do it? Sign up now to Patreon right there down below. Support the cause. Go and do your thing. Woo! How you doing, man? It's all good, isn't it? We're back. We're here. We're hanging on deep. I've got some room temperature instant coffee here in my mug because I don't because I'm a uh, I don't know. I'm a mess, I guess. I hope you're safe wherever you are at this current time in day or time and place. Um, it is a, um, it is a weird, strange things are going on in the world right now, right? Strange and interesting things. We're living in strange, interesting times. That's what needs to be said. But we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna go through some interesting topics that I've got here to run through. We're gonna do all that good stuff. Loads of cool cultural commentary pod topics that I usually run through. God Almighty, my lips are glued together today but yeah gonna run through loads of topics i've got here jam-packed action show for you so strap in get yourself a nice beverage a sandwich maybe a pringles or two or whatever you like to munch on and let's dive on in to some topics get in and out like a bloody ninja no messing around yeah cool first story to get into number one issue number one thing that kind of tickled my fancy in terms i thought was really interesting was this story about the uk's first and I repeat, the UK's first social distance concert took place in Newcastle, right? And I'm not mad at it. I think prior, there was a few other images I saw of some other social distancing type events that looked really bleak and really distressing, like this clubbing event that happened somewhere. I'm, I'm going to say somewhere in Malta or somewhere like that, where they had these rings drawn out on the, on the ground. People were literally dancing in the rings. And that was how you basically were social distance raving. And then there was another event that Gerd Janssen played in somewhere in Germany, where they have a similar sort of setup. And they had Gerd Janssen on some sort of platform behind a plexiglass and people dancing again within their little allotted circle. Um, and I was thinking, you know what? I'd much rather wait 10 years then have to like subject myself to dancing in a spray painted circle with a face mask on um, around people, right? That's just not my vibe. But I'm also curious to see what other people do who kind of want to kickstart their economy, kickstart the industry. Um, they have no other means of making an income or they just want to get out there and put their shows on. They want to connect to their fans. I'm interested to see how they go about doing things. In America, they've got the whole drive-in concert things that are p- kicking off. Um, in the UK, they tried to do something similar, but I think they kind of, <coughs> so I think they kind of ran into some roadblocks in terms of health and safety concerns, I guess, especially, I, I'd imagine the the driving events in the UK didn't work out, mostly because I'd imagine most of these events had to happen outside of London, they have to happen in the north of England, and in north of England, if you're not aware, there's... Um, you know, they've had a hard time dealing with COVID-19. Um, there's been a lot of localized lockdowns in areas um, up north. So I would assume um, the mandate across there is that, you know, you can't have any large gathering, no matter how, you know, well protected, no matter how many people are in the cars, you just, they just completely riot it off. So I'm assuming that's what that, that didn't happen at that time. Um, but I think this idea, which they kind of debuted in Newcastle, looks like an interesting approach and something that I think would probably work once everything goes back to normal. I think having these little squares where people sit inside these little boxes sort of things on platforms that see up to five people could actually be something that they could implement for VIP customers going forward. Because I've always I've always been dubious about buying tickets, VIP tickets anyway, for festivals. 
because you don't really get that much value for your money. Some of them, you get the ability to go to your own pre-designated a bar where it's not as busy. You get a different toilet to use that maybe is a bit more luxurious, quote unquote. Or if you're lucky, you get the chance of kind of intermingling around celebrities and, you know, having them be at arm's length, which I'm not really that bothered about, right? I just want to see my, my favorite acts. I want to be able to go to the bar um, easily and I want to be able to go to the loo when I want to go to the loo. But anything else apart from that, I don't really care. Or just have a good view. So I think if they wanted to, they could use this uh, model that they've got a detail here now for, that's reported from Manchester Evening News. They could use these little um, square little things and they place them maybe somewhere on a platform maybe that faces the, the stage at an angle, if you get what I mean. So like on the edges, that could be a good way to kind of give people, a, like it's another, it's a, it's an experience that would be worth the ticket price. Or you could just have them placed in front of the in front of the stage, so it's a little bit higher up on the platform, and it's not people just mingling in and, in and around each other in that little mosh bitty bit where they usually put all the VIPs. But I thought it was an interesting story regardless. So this is from Manchester Evening News. It says the following: It says due to the coronavirus pandemic, gigs may gigs many people were looking forward to to have been put on hold for at least another year. But in what um, could be a sign of the future for music lovers, the UK's first social distance concert took place last night. Uh, promoters SD Concert said the safety of their audiences was being protected as each of the concert goers had a viewing platform with its own table, chairs and fridge. The idea is that the people from the same household will arrive at the venue, park up, then enjoy the concert from their own private area, which I think is absolutely bad. I didn't know they had a fridge. That's absolutely banging. Really good idea. And, I'm, and I remember reading somewhere where there's um waiters and staff to like um take your orders for drinks and food and stuff I, I guess they just bring it to you you order and then they come along and bring it over to over to you but i think it's a great idea again for vip customers going forward i think uh, a lot of people will step up these sort of seats but in order to view something like this or in order to do something like this now i wouldn't be keen to go to a concert like this right now at this moment um if you've been to a uk festival like all points east or those kind of shitty ones you'll know that the further back you are from the stage the worse the sound is and that's a, that's usually a common theme for most festivals in the uk anyway let me not be um let me not pick out all points east which is probably why people like to go places like glastonbury because i guess because they're in the middle of nowhere and maybe the promoters and organizers have a good relationship with the local council they're able to um basically get that that volume limiter basically removed from their pa system so they can really crank it up a bit because every festival i've been to with the exception of maybe junction two the sound has been pretty terrible right and that's even places like love box and stuff right the sound isn't the best especially when they put they used to have it it's at victoria park wherever that park is in east london um it wasn't the best sound um, they had to really really uh cap it at a certain decibel again to not um annoy all the local uh all the neighbors and stuff and all the local residents so my only issue with this is be if you are going to sit if you are going to be sitting in a little cube that's spaced out two meters apart you're obviously going to be way way far back from the crowd from the stage you're probably not going to hear anything uh it's not going to be a real big festival experience and plus as well they don't have the benefit of like i think this would work really well if they had those massive screens that a lot of the bigger artists have nowadays those big screens that they put on either side of the of the stage so that if you are really far back you can still literally see the person you're going to see again it's not the best experience because if you're going to buy a ticket to go see somebody you kind of want to see them on the stage but if you're too far back to just see a little bit of a dot on the stage it's quite nice to see oh yeah cool that is the person i like you know there's a the person there's a the face it's a close-up of them dancing on the stage that is that's that might that may be might make it worthwhile but as a as an idea i'm not mad at it at all i really aren't i really am not the studio says Around 2,500 people flocked to Newcastle's Gosworth Park on Tuesday to see Sam Fender, who I don't know who that is, perform at a hometown gig. Organizers say 500 separate 500 separate raised metal platforms were set up at a pop-up site named the Virgin Money Arena. M Virgin Money Unity Arena. That's a terrible name. Uh, Sam 26 will play again on Thursday, August the 13th with performances from Sir Van Morrison, The Libertines and Maximum Park. Um, also lined up uh, throughout August and into September. Yeah, this is the most white girl event ever. And look at that. What's that? Four tins of Heineken, a massive pitcher, plastic cups everywhere, matching marks to go with the outfit, you know, do your thing. But yeah, again, it's, it's, it's for a certain demographic of people out there that would want to go see, you know, I guess if you're a fan of Sam Fender or whatever, is that his name, Sam Fender? Sam Fender, Sam Foster, what's his name? Yeah, Sam Fender, you'd probably go see someone like that play there. But I guess for, I don't know, 
it'd be unlikely that I would go and buy a ticket to go see Terry and Parlor play an event like this, right? You'd actually want to, if you go see Terry and Parlor, you want to go see them play in a sweaty festival somewhere, you know, tripping off of LSD, rubbing shoulders with some random guy you just met the other day. Um, oh, at the first day of the festival, connecting over the lyrics to, I don't know, some song that you both like, right? Um, but I guess if you're seeing these kind of like radio pop acts and stuff, it probably doesn't matter, right? You just want to, you kind of hear the same song played in your car on your way to work, so it doesn't really matter if you're hearing it <coughs> from like 500 meters away. But again, I just think it's a great idea for VIP customers going forward. I think this would really be worth the money, especially if you've got the ability. Imagine if they had these, and then you also have like a. This might be sound gross. I don't know if it is gross, but imagine you had like a port cabin or port loo attached to it. So you didn't. You literally didn't even have to leave to go to to go to another place. You could just sit there, go to a loo right next to your place that you're watching it. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. That might be a cool idea. Or you have, or you have these in a certain section where there were toilets next to them. That would be pretty cool as well. And a designated bar as well in that space. It said they have a, a fridge as well, but I don't know where the fridge is. It said there's a fridge. I'm not sure if, if that step is the fridge that you open up, or if the fridge is that little box with the ice cubes and the drinks in. I think that's the fridge, basically, isn't it? The little tub with the drinks inside them. But yeah, interesting way to do an event. Again, I'm not mad at it. I think uh, people looking at alternative ways to kind of get people out uh, to see live shows, I'm down for, especially if people want to go to them. Again, I'm probably not. I'm probably going to be sitting on the fence until there's a vaccine. Um, I don't really see the need to kind of put myself in harm's way just to, you know. Because again, for me personally, I like going out when I don't have any um hang-ups or worries at home do you know what I mean I, I, I don't want to go out in the back of my head knowing that oh yeah there's this bloody virus lingering in the air um that could catch me at any point in time and especially with my pre-existing conditions with asthma I just can't really take the chances really so it's not really and again it's not worth it I don't think there's anyone I'd want to see that bad that I'd, I'd be willing to break protocol and you know and risk my life to go and see to be honest um and I think the parties and the celebrations and the live gigs and the events are going to be far better when everyone is kind of feeling good about the situation when there's a bit more light at the end of the tunnel when we've maybe heard some rumors of a vaccine or we've got some herd immunity going on i think people are going to be far better place to kind of enjoy themselves going out than just heading out you know now and kind of battling to see sam fender play somewhere but again i like the stage idea design i think that's a really cool option to see um again let me know what you think in the comments would you go to an event like this would you be willing to go and sit uh, to see your favorite artist uh, perform on the stage far 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 in front of you like this and there's little um three to five people cubicles or would you rather wait until you have the ability to be swaying left and right like these girls are without all the barriers and the barricades with your favorite friends dropping your phone kicking some stranger standing on someone's shoulders what would you prefer let me know in the comments below ba, 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 ba. what else is next here I need to talk about oh man I miss the Bergheim and I guess I saw this video pop up on my on my um IG feed um somebody uploaded a, a Q video that they took from the Bergheim that basically encapsulates the magic of this place and it got me thinking about the beauty of going to spaces that don't permit you to take pictures or spaces where you actively don't try to take videos or pictures yourself because there's a few here in the uk like mix and the yard is similar when i go to mix or the yard i like to kind of immerse myself in the atmosphere and i don't really take out my phone too much when i go out to a smoking area i force myself to kind of speak speak to people you know have a bit of conversation maybe chit chat about who's playing what they're wearing what, whatever and it's just try and be a part of the scene in general right and i always feel like those events are usually the best um all the funnest times i've had so it's whenever i see these images of like you know a michael baby and all these kind of tech house you know twirling their fingers around the air people playing and the little hands stuff it always makes me wonder what kind of fun the people are having because most of the time whenever you watch these video clips you always see people just flashing their phones the phone flashes on continuously right they're recording the whole entire set i don't know where they put these videos because you know by and large most of the videos are going to be pretty crap right to basically re-watch but they like just filming the whole thing the entire time they're there right not really experiencing the event but i think part of the beauty of a place like bergen is strict with the door policy strict with the no taking pictures indoors and just in general right is that you have to you're kind of forced to do this weird thing that you did back in the day where you know for for sure and most people would agree that 
you remember more vividly the times when you were a teenager or maybe prior to you getting a smartphone because you didn't have any way of capturing those moments, right? Apart from using your mind, you didn't have a way to like recall them or upload them onto your social media platform. You just had to kind of remember the best times you had with your friends, falling over, uh, buying something, your first kiss, da, 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 a goal you scored, whatever, right? You remember those moments really vividly. And I think Bergan does that in a really strange way because as soon as you go, as basically... W- w- going leading up to it you're already ramping yourself up in it right because you're hoping you get in you queue in an orderly fashion you don't talk to nobody you're super quiet uh you're trying not to look too drunk you're trying not to look too high and by the time you get to the door you're just hoping that you get the nod right to go in next or 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 you're hoping that they ask you a question like it's just usually a good sign that you have an ability to get a 50 50 right do you know who's playing um blah 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 where are you from how many are you how many are you with right you're, you usually those questions are usually a good indication that your 50 50 chance of getting in if you get the straight hey not tonight it's over and of course you turn around um tuck your tail between your legs and go somewhere else right but you're already kind of psyching yourself up in a way where you're kind of okay cool I'm being well behaved as possible so that when I go in there, I'm going to have a time in my life. And you're and you're telling yourself as well, you're giving yourself a little prayer of like, God, if you let me get in there, I swear I'm going to take advantage of every little moment. I mean, I'm going to have the time in my life. I'm not going to leave until the lights come on, right? That's what you're basically doing to yourself. And then once you do get in there, guess what happens? You absolutely let loose and you have one of the best times you've ever had because you were looking forward to it so much that you were willing to, to not even try and play around with the no pictures on the dance floor thing. Now, again, you could try, but it's not the game. Um, they don't even give you an option, right? They're, they're ferocious about putting the pictures on the front and the back of your camera on your smartphone. They don't play games at all with that. And if anything, if ever you do see pictures of people indoors, you only see the pictures of people in toilets and stuff, you know, high with all their friends taking pictures and doing photo shoots. But for the most part, um, I think it's best you just go there blind, not knowing what's in the inside and just, you know, and it kind of uh, really brings, it kind of uh, allows you to really capture the moment when you do finally do get in there. So when I see this video, it's this um, person took on YouTube, or sorry, on Instagram of the queue. I don't know if this is Saturday or Sunday night. It kind of brought those memories back to me because it reminds me, you know, how it feels to be um, up against these barricades towards the front when you know you're about to get in. <coughs> how it feels like walking from the back of the street right and seeing the queue and then seeing from far seeing how far the queue's going um how it feels getting a curry works at the spot just above the, well just near where the taxi ranks are before you get into the place and it just made me miss clubbing so much man and it's a video but it just made me miss clubbing i really want to go out look how long that queue is but fyi i don't think i've ever been if I don't think I've ever been to Bergheim with a queue that's been that long. Most of the time I've been there, the queue's been probably about to a taxi rank. It's never been further than that. Uh, but the good thing about these queues is that um, much like the queue you get at a cash point, if you just wait, you're, you're definitely going to get your turn. Um, they're, they're, they're really good at making sure people, you know, are recycling in and out. And because it's open, you know, all weekend, essentially Mon- Friday to sun- Monday, it probably allows, it probably gives you a better chance to get in. Because honestly, if, if this was like a normal club that closed on like Sunday mo- Saturday morning, open at Friday night, closed at Saturday morning, and it opened again at Saturday, no one would get in. You'd be, you'd, you know what I mean? It would be a capacity for the moment to open the stores. But because it's open all weekend long, you have the ability to re-enter now for like five euros or 15 euros how much it is it gives everybody a chance to get in because people are always coming in and out going to get food going back to sleep hooking up with some other friends going to change shower whatever it may be man i, I absolutely love it they actually the last time i went i actually took a change of clothes with me that was fucking awesome i love that look at that look at that and it's incredible too how orderly the queue is. You know, in the UK, usually if this happened and there was a long queue that was going this far back, there'd be like scores of annoying bouncers shouting at everyone. Well, not, they, they're not annoying. They're only doing their job because, you know, English, UK people can't be trusted to form an orderly queue and just be quiet and kind of, you know, uh, not be a nuisance to the community. So um, they'd have to be shouting at you, everyone get in line, stop making noise, pull your drinks, da, da, da. There'd be constant shouting, there'd be people screaming, but look how quiet and orderly, well, again, the videos are sped up, but everyone's very orderly, very quiet, no colours, everyone's wearing black for the most part. Look how far back it goes, like, wow. That's insane. I really miss it, man. I really miss it. Wow. So that's why when I see these videos of these 
um business techno people playing in places like don't get me wrong they're all successful and doing their own thing their own right but there's none of these guys i'd want to see that badly enough to go and subject myself to hanging around with people that have got their phones in the air 24 hours of the day they're probably just there for the look and not so not, not, I, don't, I don't know anyway, it's not fair to say there for the look who knows they might be there for the music but regardless it's not my scene it's not my crowd it's not what i kind of look for when i go out on the nights out this is what i kind of look for because already i'm kind of you know replaying all the best nights i've had in there and again this is just representative of just the other places i'd go to it's not just only Bergham. there's other places i go to here in london too that i've got the same sort of feeling but uh this is what i miss most about uh normal life i guess um the lack of nightclubs uh the lack of spots where i can actually see good djs play um be around people that love the music as much as i do and just have a bit of a good time and let your hair down in it because at the moment like i said um i think i mentioned prior there's loads of i'm getting so many emails from different promoters um that are basically uh putting on events um you know in secret um where you have to kind of collect the ticket at a certain place you have to go to a certain door you have to you know say a different password you've got to ring a number to get the address like everyone's doing people are people are raving out there if you do, if you weren't aware especially in the uk people are out, people are going out um and i was kind of oh i kind of feel like i should do it but you know number one i wouldn't be at ease going out i wouldn't feel um i wouldn't feel comfortable in the space and i just don't think it's the right thing to do now at the moment i just don't think so i think there's a more important things that people need to do day in day out with their lives and you know getting their situation in order in terms of you know what they're gonna do when everything's over and how they kind of want to be once everything is kind of opens up again but to go to a rave now it just doesn't feel like the right time in my opinion again um that's just what i feel about it. and then i guess i saw and other this other video that kind of made me miss dancing on a dance floor. This incredible video of this girl. I'm pretty sure it might be pretty old, but it's a, it's a girl um, that's dancing at the end of a gig somewhere. I'm not sure where she is, but it's pretty amazing and pretty inspiring. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Man. That's all about. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun of it. Man, I miss going out so much, man. That's what it's all about, isn't it? That's really what it's all about, man. Just being in your own head, uh, dancing away the night. Uh, and just having the time of your life in it, just letting loose, letting being free. And again, I just don't know if I could do the same sort of thing with a face mask on, knowing full well that you know I could potentially be putting loads of people's lives at risk by, um, you know, um, scratching my own itch. I don't think it's worth it now. I just don't think so. I'd much rather do it when everyone else is doing it, really, when it's safe to do it, and I don't feel as if I'm going to cause the death of somebody's grandma. I don't know. Maybe I'm a bit of a p word in that regard, but hey. What can you do? Uh, next on the list, what else do we have here? <coughs> there was some what protests in Berlin. I'm not sure what they're protesting about. Maybe they want to protest about the reopening of the nightclubs and stuff. I'm assuming. What does it say here on the caption? It says here, big protest in Berlin. Club and clubs and promoters and workers want the scene to be reopened. What are your thoughts on this? I don't know how accurate this is as a description. I'm not sure how constructive this is as well to be protesting. Um, I'm sure. <clears throat> I don't know, but it depends. I'm sure. I don't say I'm sure because I guess in some places there is a feeling that a lot of these politicians are quick to close down things, but then don't have a plan of how they're going to restart the economy in a safe a manageable way and also in a way that prevents the loss of numerous amounts of jobs in it that's the issue at hand because i'm sure a lot of these places will be like look we're happy to kind of um go by code but you need to kind of give us something right you need to kind of allow us to have a grant maybe um you know give us some sort of leeway when it comes to paying the rent on the place there needs to be some give in terms uh, if for the clubs and promoters it feels as if like they should abide by the rules because i think we've seen a similar sort of arguments happen in the states with gyms I forgot where it was. It might be New Jersey or something. A gym in New Jersey had its license revoked. The owners had to go to court. They boarded up the place. They revoked his business license. They boarded up the gym. The owners got released from prison or sorry, released from um, the police station uh, pending their court case. They went back to the gym, burst the door down, took off the 
the temporary um, boarding up of the doors and reopen it basically and they didn't care how many fines they got and they were basically arguing that hey show us the science that tells us that we should be closed and it's safer not to have our gym open and then we'll close but if not we're going to keep it open because they generally feel as if like people need to have a gym open or need to have the ability to work out if they're going to beat corona you know those kind of wacky american uh, conspiracy theories but regardless right they had that was kind of what they were fighting against and i guess there's there might be some molecule of truth to it because you feel as if like um it's mostly these individuals or groups that are the ones that are responsible for leading the way in how an economy is going to reopen in any place especially in the united states it feels like governments are quite slow to kind of react and maybe they're kind of you know enjoying the sense of power they have by closing things down telling people they can't reopen citing science and stuff right it's quite an enjoyable process but in germany i'm not too sure what the deal is because i think the numbers in germany are pretty high still same with spain same with italy so i'd imagine some of the reservations behind it are well founded in terms of opening the clubs and again berlin isn't like most places berlin has a real good uh, relationship with his nightlife scene uh, they're very aware of the value it brings right uh, berkheim has been registered as a what is it? it's like a it's got some sort of special dispensation at the berkheim right they give grants to clubs all the time so i'm sure i'm pretty sure they're not doing it in any sort of malice they're not doing it as any sort of government of governmental oversight they're obviously doing it because they know once they reopen the floodgates in germany um similar to what's happening in italy with people going to these tech house parties they know once they reopen the floodgates and say hey the scenes open again or the clubs reopen it's going to be absolutely jam-packed so they can't take any chances of having things reopen and then have a huge spike in cases and then close them down again because that, that that could kill some places and it could also damage the reputation of the country uh, for a long time so they have to really take a long-term view at it but i guess you know people are going to protest people are going to dance to techno love parade vibes all that's malarkey <laughs> work in germany or in berlin there's no one work no one have a day job like this is mad isn't it? it's bad people are, i guess it's on a weekend and maybe they could argue but jesus christ yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. people be protesting in it so I, I don't know man look I'm, I'm part of the scene you know i dj myself i put on events um i like to go to you know some of the best clubs in the world and have a good time uh but i don't know man i just don't i just don't think this is the most um what you call it i don't know there's a part of me that 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 believes that this isn't the most crucial part of the economy that needs to reopen straight away i think there's other parts of the economy that need to open you know uh before clubs do they probably have a more of a right to feel aggrieved that the slow turnaround and the in you know um the way the inadequate way some of the governments have been dealing with coronavirus um but i think nightclubs can probably wait especially considering the risks at hand um you don't necessarily want to have you know god forbid they open up too soon and a whole slew of people get get covid you know they then go on to pass it on to different places there's no track and trace it's just not the best way to go about things so there's a really a lot at stake really here to be honest and this course for a real this calls for people to be responsible to act like adults and actually be like you know what we know we want to rave we know we want to let our hairs down but let's actually take the time to hope hopefully let things get back to some kind of normality and then we can restart the raving thing but for now it probably doesn't seem like a good idea in my opinion again what do i know next on the list we have an interesting development regarding italy and spain concerning clubs because this is something i've talked about previously with the immediate lens thing um and nina kravitz going to places jamie jones played um 
somebody else as well. I forgot loads of other, you know, tech housey business tech over people. Um, <coughs> I guess it looks like oh, this is an article here from Euro News it says the following. <coughs> Sorry, hey, people got dry and cough today. It says the following it says, Coronavirus Italy closes nightclubs as authorities blame holidaymakers for new outbreaks. So, the Italian government moved to make masks mandatory between 18, between 6 and 4 a.m. in an effort to curb the spread of coronavirus after recording over 600 new cases on Saturday. Almost 800 others on Sunday and nearly three times more last week. The country, which was the first Europe to Western Europe to institute a lockdown, also closed nightclubs amid the uptick in cases. Unlike the first coronavirus outbreak, which uh, saw affected, which uh, saw f- affected mostly Lombardy and other northern areas, the second wave struck much more uniformly across the country with hundreds of local outbreaks. On Sunday, the region recording the most cases was Lazio in central Italy. Um, the another different from the March and April outbreak it says here let's pause this one spot. Oh, oh, no stop no, but outbreak pandemic is that the average age of those getting infected has dropped dramatically to 39 which is definitely in line with all the people going out raving and stuff um, it says here health minister Roberto Spare be Speranza, 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 yeah. Roberto Speranza has called on the youngsters to give a hand in keeping the outbreak under control. During an interview with the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, published on Monday, he also ruled out the opening of reopening of schools will be delayed, but warned no mistake can be made at this stage. Health authorities have also pointed out the rise in COVID cases partially to blame, but on holidaymakers, as travelers coming from Croatia, Greece, Malta, and Spain have now begun to be tested upon arrival to Italy, which um, with first. 30,000 test kits dispatched to the Rome airports of Campi of Campiano and Flumencin- Flumencinio on Sunday only. It's the quote, depending on the region, 25% to 40% of the new cases are recorded among people returning from holiday uh, or from foreigners living in Italy. <coughs> President of the Super Superior Council of Health, Franco Lucatelli, told the Italian newspaper um, Il Correra della Sera. He also stated that three three percent to five percent of the new infections are coming from migrants. That is mad. And again, this may be um, put some blame on those DJs playing out there, isn't it? At this time, again, it's hard to blame the DJs because if the promoters don't put on the events, they don't play. Right? They're sort of like hired guns. Uh, they're sort of like um, what electronic music prozies in that regard, right? Is that way to it's not really, it's not really kind to say that, but hey, you get what I mean, right? If the events are not on, DJs can't play. But there's also a responsibility for the DJs to kind of think about it holistically and be like, hey, what message am I sending out there, going out to play at a packed venue, especially the ones I show you the videos prior that me lens very she's playing at. These are not some you know wishy washy um in some random crusty warehouse place. These are like proper productions, right? Proper produced events with pa systems and lighting and you know great bars and good spacing and just you know very very well done so to put on these events could give people the wrong impression about what's happening with corona especially when you consider how hardly hit or how badly hit italy was um you know in the in the early stages it, it probably they probably owed it upon themselves to be a little bit more cautious but i also understand that you know the italian economy is probably suffering greatly due to covid was suffering greatly prior to covid so i can only imagine what they're suffering now do you know what i mean so they probably were stuck between a rock and a hard place where like hey man we need to really open up the economy we need to get people back here we need to get tourism back here again we need to crank it up again and get people back traveling around our region because we cannot risk having the entire year completely off the books when it comes to tourism right but i don't know man if you're those djs you're you're gonna have to feel a little bit of guilt around the situations going on especially people that play that play the spain i know sarah kim played there um some club in spain were reopened they had like social distancing there as well obviously we saw the videos of bibi playing in places as well i just think you know again it's just it just doesn't seem like the right thing to do now in 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 that respect you would assume people would be a little bit more uh a little bit more cautious about going out especially in these times but i guess what you have seen is 
people are aware of how bad it looks because you don't see any of these guys posting videos of themselves playing in these places. They're just uploading pictures of them post set or maybe they're uploading some random indescript picture of them in a place that happened to be the place where they were playing at, but not in front of a crowd, right? I mean, Lenz didn't post any footage of her playing in that um, possession party the other week or a couple of weeks ago. So they obviously know what they're doing is quote unquote bad, but there is a part of me that's also like, hey, there, it, most of the blame has to be put to the feet of the promoters, right? If they're willing to put on these events at this kind of scale, they have to bear some responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the DJ. They don't, they like, a DJ shouldn't be responsible for the health and safety of, an, of a venue or for the, it, it being up to code. It should be, you know, whoever owns the building, whoever's putting on the event to make sure all the T's are, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted so that the artists can come and do their job and go home. I did, especially in the beginning when I used to DJ, when I DJed in the beginning, one of the horriblest things to go through was when you had to do those things where you'd have a promoter that asked you to sell tickets to for the gig. Like you, you get booked for a gig, you get paid some measly rate, and then on top of that, they'd request you to sell tickets, right? That was always the worst thing because, like, hey, that's not my job. My job here is to play. You want me to play at your night because you thought my sound could uh, be a good addition to what you guys have got going on. It could keep people dancing on the dance floor, whatever it is, right? You brought me in for a certain uh to do a certain role when it comes to selling tickets that should be predominantly down to you i have no sell in this whatsoever do you know what i mean the most i can do is basically share your bloody flyer on my social media feed and even that it's like no i'm joking but yeah you know, do you know what i mean um so i think the, the blame should be really laid at the feet of the promoters and really the partners going <laughs> Because to break your to break lockdown to go see Michael Bibby play in this sort of environment is really weird because he does this every year anyway. It's not like a unique experience. I guess for him, it's probably cool because he gets to get out of his house. And again, you know, he, he's a decent enough producer, a, a good DJ in his own right in, in that scene, in a tech house scene. But it's not as if you're like going to something like, oh my God, this is like, oh, an eye-opening experience. I can't miss this. Like he literally plays the same gig the same places for the same people every single year the same all that crowd though the whole tech house crowd it's not as if they're like oh you know like there's nothing groundbreaking about anything they play the music there i don't know do you know what i mean like so for you to go there as a punter you have to really take a look at yourself in the mirror to be honest <laughs> look at the phones look at the phones Hardly any dancing. Everyone's just... It's a really... Again, like I said before, it's an odd crowd, the Tech House crowd, isn't it? They treat DJs like um, like bands or like artists or rappers. I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? They all just stand there like looking at the person, like just squash up looking at them. It's like very bizarre. When when you go see a DJ play, you'd imagine... Because in my head, I see festivals or these kind of stages as an extension of the club, right? So you're kind of doing it in an open air environment, like in a, like kind of you know that's where the term open air comes from, right? You're kind of doing it like in a you know in a bit of a free environment, it's a pub, maybe different stages around, but it's extension of the club. So if it's extension of the club, you don't really care where the DJ is located. You just want to dance, right? Oh, he's playing sick. Harvey's on. Du -du -du -du. It might be good to get a bit of wave, say his name, say you love him, whatever. But just keep it moving. But you're not just gonna stand there like with your hands in it like that, looking at the person. It's just a bit odd. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that really I don't know that look at it and I'm a bit. I, I'm a bit miffed by it, but again, the production of this event is impeccable. Big, massive, what's to call it? Um, what do you call it? Or is it auditorium? You'd say them, right? Auditorium, shapes thing, very well produced, but this has to be a responsibility of the, of the promoters. They're the ones that did this, right? It wasn't Michael Bibby's fault, was it? Because, you know, like, again, if this is your kind of vibe and you kind of, you know, break lockdown to go see him like this, then, you know, I, I get it. And for him as well, it must be a good event to go to. Still no dancing. That's a good tune as well. Still no dancing. Look. Minimal dancing. Interesting, isn't it? Man's got a pill in his mouth. Nice. Still no dancing. The camera's doing more movements than the actual people. God almighty, man. What a bizarre people. What a bizarre group of... Uh, what a bizarre subsect of the dance music scene, isn't it? 
very interesting. Even the people that go to Tomorrowland seem to have a little bit more fun dancing and having a, a jovial time at the event than these lot. Very interesting. And again, blame the promoters. Don't blame the DJs, in my opinion. That's what I think. I think that should be the case. And also, um, yeah, I don't know, man. Pl blame the promoters. Really blame the promoters. I, I really think the promoters need to take responsibility for this because to put an event of that scale, knowing what's going on, especially in Italy, right? Like, they live in... Like, <coughs> most of, I'd, I'd imagine most of the Mediterranean people have a very close connection or close relationship with... Um, the older members of their family, right? They all live usually in the same household. I think that's why they said coronavirus ravaged through the Mediterranean a lot more than it did in other places in Europe because they tend to all live in the same household. Um, they take care of their older people and their family. So there is more likelihood that you're able to kind of <coughs> um, pass the virus on between family members. I think we even remember seeing cases of people in Italy uh, contracting uh, corona, right? And then passing it on to the entire household and people, you know, it's just some tragic stories. So you'd imagine they'd be a little bit more responsible and a little bit more kind of aware of what they're doing. And like, hey, we can't take the piss too much because, you know, literally we live with grandma and she could legitimately die. But I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe it's a natural reaction to all that misery. They just want to get out and celebrate and they don't want to think about um, anything too much, right? They've had a really torrid time. The, the economy is suffering. People probably don't have that great prospects now going forward with all this time being spent under lockdown. Maybe it's just a natural reaction to just be like, you know what? Let Leave me alone. I don't. I know it's not right. I'm just going to put on this event so I can have some level of like um, positivity this year um, concerning everything that's going on. I don't really know, man. But let me know your thoughts. What do you think? Do, would you blame the promoters? Do you blame the DJs? Um, is everyone to blame? Is no one to blame? What's the deal? Let me know in the comments down below. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Next on the list. Uh, okay, let's talk about let's talk about Virgil V. Walter Van Buren. Um, this seems like a bit of a cut and dry topic. I don't really see why this is causing such an outrage online, but I guess because Virgil tends to divide opinion regardless of what you may think of him in general i guess he does yeah i guess because he divides opinion people are, are up in arms but essentially walter van beerdok um a storied member of the antwerp six and somebody that i think a lot of people in fashion have a lot of respect for and somebody who kind of really does their own thing doesn't really kick up a fuss really for the most part you don't really hear his name in the headlines he kind of goes about his work pretty quietly uh puts out some interesting um clothes and accessories and has a very unique point of view when it comes to fashion and it's probably referenced a lot by uh many i guess younger designers because someone like a Walter would be an example to younger designers that you know that you can keep that kind of youthful expression and that sort of carefree attitude to fashion and not treat it as seriously as a business as some other people do and and sort of have fun with it um so I'd imagine he's probably referenced a lot with kids coming up in fashion schools and stuff but for the most part he just does his own thing and kind of keeps his head down and you know that's about it but I guess Virgil's latest show that he did kind of sparked a bit of ire online and people kind of saw the re the references or the links to the work that Walt has done. And I guess with Virgil's linking up with that um, stylist, is it, Im what's his name? Imran something? So, I forgot his name. But I guess with Virgil linking up with that new stylist, he's probably injected a new... Um, a new point of view maybe kind of freshen things up again for Virgil maybe made him uh get become more inspired uh kind of pull from different places or just probably kind of asked him some interesting questions so this is probably a consequence of this right when he kind of is linked up with an actual capital F fashion person in this new stylist he has now working with him at Louis Vuitton it would make sense that he would kind of uncannily uh start maybe copying or imitating some of the stuff that Walter's done in the past um but I guess the the kind of the controversy is that Virgil denies it Virgil's friends are coming out and backing him and saying that he didn't do anything wrong and he's a black guy all this sort of stuff blah blah blah, blah. but for me it looks pretty cut and dry he obviously did copy or reference from Walter I think it's fair to say Virgil's been quite honest and upfront about the fact that he does reference and copy and he doesn't really see anything wrong with it um he kind of uh that's the kind of school of fashion or design that he comes from right referencing and taking and remixing of different things out there and sort of distilling in, in, in his own point of view but I don't really see where all the controversy is with all this stuff. I really don't. Like, he obviously did copy it. He did it in his own way. People seem to like it. And it is what it is, isn't it? But this is an article here from Hypebeast. It says, 
Bojabo refutes uh, the claims of invitation. It says Louis Vuitton's playful spring summer collection was intended to be a celebration of creativity in the quarantine and owed to ide uh, ideation that stood tall amidst the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Instead, the affair was uh, instead the affair had exploded with social media furor as Anto Six member Walter Van Beerdonk uh, lambasted the fashion house and artistic director Virgil Abloh for his perceived imitation. Van Beerdonk um, and his fans pointed out elements of Louis Vuitton's spring summer 21 presentation including stitched up plus uh, figures and asymmetric eyewear that coincided with the Royal Fashion Art Antwerp's professor's previous collection, Pacific Event Bidders 2016 and 2018. Some eagle eyed supporters took steps further, alluding to uh, the, fur the through lines of the inflatable jackets and deconstructed tailoring. And of course, looking at it, you can tell straight away that this is stuff that would be referenced from Walter. And I don't see the argument here. Like, this is from a guy that has told us categorically that he will copy everything out there. He doesn't see anything wrong with it, right? He does it in his own way presents it in a different way and people seem to like it but there's no denying that there are similarities or you know eerily similarities connecting those two things right like these two collections that like there's no way you can say that's not the case especially the glasses like jesus christ look at this right like this is pretty cut and dry like and you have to also be you have to let's just like, be honest too like we've never seen virgil present work this way he, he doesn't like you know well, the most of the stick that Virgil gets is because he tends to kind of uh, deviate from presenting his work in a kind of quintessential fashion way. It tends like, you know, most of it looks like it's a haberdashery, um, you know, stitch patchwork of loads of different references from all different all different places. There's no kind of theme that kind of ties it all together. It's just a random collection of clothes, you know, done in his own sort of way. And, you know, people tend to like it, but this was maybe the first collection I've seen of Virgil's at Louis Vuitton. Maybe it was the inclusion of this new stylist that he has on board now, who I'm going to try and get the name of because this is not it. I forgot his name now. Louis Vuitton stylist Virgil. What is his name? I think it's Ibrahim something. Da, 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 da. What's his name? I think it's Ibrahim. Let me see if I can get up on here. Da, 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 da. Search. Come on. Ibrahim. I'm pretty sure it's Ibrahim something. I want to get his name right. <clears throat> da, 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 da. Yeah, that's it. Ibrahim Kamara. Yeah, I'm sure. I knew it. That's the guy, yeah. So, Virgil's got a new stylist. His name's Ibrahim Kamara. And I'm sure he's the person that has kind of elevated the Louis Vuitton because like, when I saw the pictures the images of this new collection anyway it did really strike me like oh wow this is really impressive this is probably the best stuff I've seen Virgil do in ages isn't it right um and it's no coincidence that now he's linked up with this this guy who kind of everyone seems to be really hyped on in the fashion industry now at the moment um his, his work has really been elevated to another level right those are that's kind of a quintessential fashion thing right you need to have these great relationships these great partnerships between the designers uh creative director fashion directors and the stylists really do make uh, the house go pop or whatever the place that you're designing at. so it's no there's no surprise that this guy would come in and suddenly people are now referencing you know Virgil kind of ripping off somebody from the Antwerp Six and somebody, especially somebody as, ab as obscure from like maybe you know the general public's point of view as Walter Van Burdick. It's, it's, it's no surprise, really, in it. But there's no really argument here. The clothes do look quite similar to what Walter did. It is what it is. He, like I said before, like nothing that Virgil's on prior would ever tell you that he would ever be possible of evolving into this sort of designer you know most of the stuff is just a question of clothes even the, even the shades like that's not something that will maybe the shades are probably something that Virgil could argue that he's a part of his DNA a part of his code right the messing about with the proportions that could be something, but it's pretty cut and dry for me in that regard. And it continues here. It says, I think this is the quote. It says, Virgil did, did it again. This is not just copying. This is using my world, my ideas, colors, signatures, cut shapes as his collection mood board said Van Bidon. So the hype beats on August the 7th. He said one day after the collection premiered, he said he paid a huge amount of money to be an artistic director oh he is paid i thought he said he paid jesus christ he has paid a huge amount of money to be an artistic director and he has unlit possibilities to work with anybody in the world um, he could have asked me for a collaboration tell Louis vuitton to contact the real thing god damn he said on august 12th less than a week after initial um scuffle abler tweeted screenshots of the louis vuitton runway show highlighting a model wearing a clutching teddy bear and similar manner figures that graced his 2021 runway show so i'm guessing this is basically his way of basically telling people hey i didn't steal from walter i referenced the uh the own my own house collection which you know is a bit of a stretch really i think this is one of those kind of um 
uh, this thing's where when you get caught out, you just try and search for some sort of proof to kind of, you know, back up your point. But we know for sure he did copy from Walter, and it is what it is, isn't it? Um, whether or not he should be doing it is another thing. But I guess because people don't like Virgil anyway, anything he does is always kind of looked at with a different sort of eye. But for him to suggest that somehow, I think, yeah, this is a tweet I've got up here on my screen. This is common. Virgil needs to be a bit more sensible. This is him self-referencing from Louis Vuitton, August tw Louis Vuitton 2005, because somebody's carrying a teddy bear and the model's carrying a teddy bear and he's saying that's where he referenced it from. Come on, Virgil, man. Come on. We know that isn't true, brother. Let's go back to the article. It says here, the same day Kanye reappeared on Twitter to issue countless stream of conscious tweets, two of those cited the recent LV controversy citing a challenging Diet Prada and Van Bierdot to come get us all. High Diet Prada, high water, come for us all. Lows. It's funny that you haven't heard an absolute peep from Diet Prada regarding this though, isn't it? They do not want the smoke. I guess after all that stick they got during lockdown um, with some of the um, accusations of um culture vulturing and i think they posted that was it that yay yeah i think it was a yeezy gap merch that was like um make america great again and stuff people kind of basically turned on diet prada so now diet prada don't want the smoke they don't want to smoke with minorities they're just kind of going you know they're trying to stick stay out of this as much as possible and everyone and it's funny because everyone's calling for them to stick the boot in on virgil but they're like nope no thank you we don't want that smoke we want to keep our little Instagram page going. And it continues here. It says, late on August 13th, Abdo directed address the matter itself. He said, Walter Van Beer's claims are completely false. Um, he said, they are tape field attempt to discredit my work. The inspiration for my collection comes from the DNA Louis Vuitton, Pacific 2055 menswear show. And it is clearly outlined in notes distributed to the press when the show began. This is yet another instance of false equivalency to try and discredit me as a designer. It's interesting that he's saying that, though, because he always he never really gave us the impression that he wanted to be regarded as a fashion designer. But now he's very conscious about people discrediting himself as a, as a designer, which is which would make sense. isn't it? when you get beat up as much as him online, there probably is a there probably comes a point where you're like, you know what? Enough is enough. You, you motherfuckers need to put some respect on my name. I know you might not like what I do, but you have to respect my 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 work. Do you know what I mean my uh, le level of effort that I put into it? Because there's no denying, man, for somebody as for somebody that people regard as not that talented, for him to be a position that he's in now and doing what he does, he's obviously doing something right. So I guess he has to stick up for himself in that regard. But come on, man, you can't tell me this has been referenced from Virgil like, from Louis Vuitton 2005. This is obviously, you know, taking cues from what Walter's doing. There's no shame in it. Like, again, he's the guy that says that he self-references anyway. Um, it's like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, it continues here. Ba, 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 ba. he says the show notes did not directly allude to the 2005 runway show there we go but they did explore Abloh's uh, desperate influences um, in painstaking detail mentions of nuance irony and recognized influence uh, 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 what's that abutted abutted reflections upon the upcycling of ideas presumably intended as a nod to spring 20, 2005 collection elsewhere quotes from the philosopher uh, Kierkegaard and influential band leader Sun Ra prepped the 40 plus page page note document later explaining the concept and backstory Abloh's Zoom with Friends mascots. Uh, these figures were realized in the spring summer 21 runway show by way of aforementioned plush figures inflatable sculptures. Oh, but this is not come on man this is this is a reach if you express us to believe that's a reach and then of course um, the Virgil Defense Squad came out swinging you know all guns blazing defending his honor um, I guess the first being uh, Denim Tears came out and said something. I think this is from Fashion Demix. He basically came out and called uh, called out Walter by his name and said, you don't touch my Virgil guy. He gives me free Jordans. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Some of this stuff is just a nonsense, really. You did copy. It is what it is. You keep it moving. But this is Denim Tears on Fashion Demix. He basically says the following. It says, Denim Tears responds to a troll in the comments uh, uh, on Virgil's behalf. Says uh, So this is a quote. It says, uh, Denim Tears quote on Twitter. Says the following. If you're a woman or a POC or an LGBT, take and manipulate what you want from the canon of white male art. All you want. A lot of it is was ripped us from, from us anyway. And if it wasn't, it was and if it wasn't it was is shoved down our throat as a standard above all else so manipulate and flip as you like which is you know you could just replace it and say everyone should take from everybody that's you know great artist still um we know that quote you know my my favorite artist Pablo picasso was one of those people that kind of you know said that as well and then somebody in the comments of that post where he basically up you know 
because I'm always, you know, I always people that t- people that screenshot their own tweets and upload them onto Instagram are a special type of people. So you know, you deserve a bit of stick for this one. And it continues. It says someone replied to that tweet and said, "You're gonna make Virgil bust inside the way you're riding him so hard." It's just funny. And he says, "Not before Walters phallic headdresses appropriate from Africa tribes do." Hop over to my Insta stories for more info, which is, you know, him trying to ride for his man, which is, I guess, admirable. But the only issue I have with all this sort of stuff is that these guys only have stuff to say when it's stuff to do with fashion and clothes. When Kanye is freaking out and essentially sabotage, intentionally, if you believe the stories, sabotaging Joe Biden's campaign so that he can segue votes over to Trump, they don't say a, a damn thing. When Kanye is out here, losing his mind in public they don't say a damn thing in public but whenever it's virgil and people are accusing him of copying some trainers or a bloody hem or some belt or a bloody inflatable toy in a jacket they all come out guns blazing like defending him like you know like as if he's their father or something it's very very bizarre very very odd but again i understand you know if he gives you front row sheets at his show he gives you off-white jordans um you get to talk to him on on snapchat or, 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 or i don't know or whatsapp or whatever these things these guys are always kind of hyped about i get the understanding of it and you know maybe it's just a clout game so you just have to always protect your your person that gives you the most clout points again fashion demics covered a lot more of it here um says so the following uh what Mateo is water van being dot co size the blatant drip off virgil is accused of another more screenshots of him copying the work that he done prior which you can't really deny i think looking at it it does quite it does look quite cut and dry but again if you're a fan of his maybe you say oh no it's original but it's like virgil's never been original though that, that's his, he's basically claimed to fame in it copying and pasting cutting and pasting and putting it in his own light and it? it's not really a bad thing to say really um maybe because it's walter and he's a he has his own um he has his own issues he has to deal with his own work right i think tribalism is one of those things right he has this weird fetishism with um the black male form which can get a little bit weird um i guess so maybe that's part of it but yeah there's no you know what i mean look at that there's another one i hate copycats what a van burdick went he went hard on on virgil and he was going in He's really, really going at him. More examples of work that are similar. The glasses are, that's cut and dry, the sunglasses. There's no real way to kind of mask that. But again, sunglasses, much like apps, are probably the, one of the, the most copied um, segments or sectors in fashion. People tend to always rip off each other's designs in some way, shape or form. Come on, man. Come on, guys. What are we doing here? Again, no one's saying no, Walter uh, um, owns these um, inflatable puppets or these dolls, whatever, but let's be real. Like, let's be real. Let's be real. Uh, sorry, let's continue again. Another one here. Oh, again, that's the same one. And I think that's about it, isn't it? Da, 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 da. More copying examples. What have we got to say here? Diet Prada's not getting involved. And then, yeah, I guess that's it, really, in that regard, that story. There's nothing more to add, really. Um, Virgil's friends are defending him because, you know, they have to defend him because he is Virgil and they are who they are. Um, but I don't get the defense. I think it's pretty cut and dry. And if he has, if it has to, happens to be an uncanny resemblance, so be it. We apologize to put our hands up. But for the most part, Virgil's told us amongst uh, loads of times over the years that he does like to copy. He does like to take from things, um, reference from history. He has his own archive of personal items that he buys that he references from. Like he's always on Instagram. He, his collections even look like an Instagram you know that's probably part of his maybe downfall the fact that he spends so much time on social media kind of maybe negatively affects the work that he puts out right it's not really informed by living um in the same way that you know a kim jones collection is again not fair to compare the two because you know one's a uh, trained or experienced designer one's maybe only got 10 only 10 years they're saying the industry which isn't a lot uh, considering that you know kim jones has worked within the fashion industry or infrastructure for a far longer time than that maybe he's still on his training wars but it's not you know it is what it is the guy copies um, um he got called out he got called out for it it was pretty blatant and we just keep it moving but you know it's interesting to see his defense squad coming out defending him and then you know trying to make it into a race thing which i'm not sure why it is but hey um, I guess it's easier because Walter Van Beerdok happens to be white. If he wasn't, then I, and I, I'm interested to see what the conversation would be about because there were allegations prior of Virgil taking from, you know, younger black designers who came to Inter. I'm not sure if that even was even proved right, but I remember it was like a yellow anorak 
um, that was covered in like a uh, spray paint and stuff that looked very similar to what this kid done that came um kind of you know asked Virgil for help and insight and then obviously we know what happened with Virgil and the and the cover for the sp smoke thing so there's always been a bit of controversy when it comes to him creating his work there is this thing that happens I don't know why it always happens to him but you know it, there is you no know, where, where there's smoke there's fire there is obviously something going on there in his studio and how how he approached design that's obviously rubbing people up the wrong way or maybe it's just his presence in general maybe it's just the fact that he's just made it at the level that he's made it um considering the lack of um skill compared to his peers that he has just rough people out the wrong way and never gonna accept it i don't know but it was interesting i remember when raf simmons said that really spicy thing about him i mean that, that was a bit odd because you know it's not as if raf simmons and virgil have the same customers right i, I wouldn't imagine so it's they're not competing for the same retail space even right um one is a, a real legend in menswear and has his pace solidified in the fashion hall of fame and one person's coming up and you know getting their start it's not as if you know what i mean it's not as if like virgil's demna or anything um again not a slight on him but i, I never really understood why raf came at him so hard but that's maybe indicative of um systemic issue there maybe some unconscious biases um unconscious um racial discrimination i'm not too sure who knows really but uh it's interesting to see this battle play out in public um it's a bit you know it's a little bit gay to be honest you know people arguing about inflatable toys stuck on trench coats but hey this is the fashion world that we live in people get agitated very very easily <laughs> oh god almighty what can you do um what else is next on this list i want to talk about we're an hour in we're an hour in oh let's end here right um it seems like amy kufman the woman that's responsible for taking down all my favorite comedians is potentially turning into the west coast version of seth simons i think every la comedian every um LA improv comedian stand up whatever you are you have to be very very worried very very afraid Amy Kaufman might be coming after you next because she's literally reporting on every single development that has to ascertain to the whole Chris D'Elia, Brian Callen, Brendan Shaw, Tifa K, sexual misconduct, allegation, allegations, blah 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 blah. She's basically reporting on anything blow by blow. And she's really painting it in a pretty negative light. It seems like for the most part. So if you're a comedian in in LA uh or and you haven't decided where you wanna move, uh with everybody leaving LA, you probably might want to move to to houston or to texas with joe or to anywhere else that happens to be outside of the california state because this woman is coming for all of your jobs and she doesn't give a scooby shit so this is one of, this is a story here from los angeles times it says after allegations brian cannon asks fans to pay for a new podcast on patreon which is so inflammatory he didn't say that he didn't ask them to pay for anything um you need to if you want to support you want to support this it just makes it seems as if like you know he is a what you call it they're, they're painting him out to be a bit of a jerk which he obviously isn't right um he has it's not his fault that he can't speak in his own podcast platform because you decided to publish stories um alleged that he raped somebody you know in the 80s or 90s uh, without having without giving him his time to kind of you know defend himself in court again you know the, the culture we live in at the moment an, an accusation is is as you know is as bad as a guilty verdict and now he's in a position where his sponsors of his main podcast the fire and the kid probably don't want him anywhere near that podcast so he has to now <coughs> sorry he has to now do a show behind a paywall in order to kind of speak to his fan or speak to his truth <coughs> which is pretty unfair to be honest isn't it if you consider it what's going on especially if, especially if you're innocent if you're guilty whatever even if you're not guilty you should be given the chance to just speak your piece right in public you shouldn't be ousted or dismissed from the public forum again he's got his twitter and instagram i know but you know so Amy Amy Kaufman reports here after recently announced announcing that he will take a leave of absence from his podcast. Brian Cannon is getting back behind the microphone. <coughs> Bloody this woman! On Wednesday, Callan said he would return on to return to Patreon, the crowdfunded membership platform, so he could continue podcasting. The comedian made an announcement in a since deleted video post on Twitter account for the Tiff and the Kid podcast. He co-hosted with former UFC heavyweight Brendan Shaw. On July 31st, the Times published the accounts of four women who alleged that the Goldberg actor has sexually inappropriate with them. Callan categorically denied all allegations, which included rape, assault, and disturbing comments. But he said later that he would obviously temporarily distance himself from the fire and the kid, <coughs> which I thought was really admirable, personally. 
he took the decision to do that to kind of shave save their main cash cow especially during these turbulent times that was really good of him um despite that proclamation Callum vowed not to stay out of public eye uh, he said you know when you're in a situation like this you get a lot of advice and there we heard that one before and she says oh she says the fire in the key has continued to release new episodes with Shaw posting alongside his guest host Shaw, who began working in the comedy after his youth career told listeners that he would stick by his long-term friend even though Callum had requested not to go hard in the paint for him he said, he said, apparently, if I say what I want to say, it's going to get kind of in more trouble. We definitely agree with that one. It says here, yeah, Cast Media does not, which does not produce the Fire and the Kid, but represents his partner show, had a different stance. Really? So, so yeah, Cast takes the allegations against hosts very seriously. The company's chief executive, Colin Thompson, said in the email, Brian Cannon is long associated with Cast representation of Fire and the Kid. So, which is interesting, right? They spoke a big game about being independent and only their thing, but essentially, this parent company, Cast Media, is 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 the is the people that basically told Cannon he can't be on Fire and the Kid anymore, which is annoying. I think. Um, again, it's interesting how these, how they talk a big game right about being independent and doing their own thing on the on a podcast and not being beholden by the industry um and not being dictated by the industry and having to go to auditions all this sort of stuff right but then the moment they get into some trouble because they signed a deal which i'm assuming is beneficial for them monetarily right cast probably you know handle all the partnerships and sponsorships and maybe give them a bit of money a month or whatever it may be so they can have them as part of their roster so they can attract other clients blah 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 they kind of act as like managers for the show but the issue is that they can also call the shots right because they could stipulate that hey our sponsors that we got you on board that are paying you x amount of money a month are going to pull out if you don't get this guy off the show and it's easy decisions to make i guess so as commendable as it was for brian to suggest that he kind of decided to pull away from the show um i don't think he was ever going to get back on anyway especially with the allegations in um, um up in the air still uh it says here cast takes allegations seriously da, da, da. it says furthermore tom thompson said cast has no association with brian Cannon activity on the patreon or elsewhere and it's not aware of any plans for Cannon to ever return to find a kid jesus christ so i guess they're saying and uh, uh, unless Callan gets a completely non-guilty verdict and it comes out that this entire story was fabricated and somehow you know um i don't know the women lied and tricked amy into believing the story was true or she purposely spun it in a way to make it believable which she should be in trouble for if this is the case it seems like you know you're never going to hear Callan on fighting the kid anymore it seems like by this article i'm not sure if that's true i think if he if it, if it does get proved to be a false story i'm pretty sure they will probably welcome him back with open arms because there's only so much of josh wolf and brendan Shaw. But i'm sure most fighting the kid fans will be able to stomach even though i'm a big fan of josh i think you know the you know it's the fire and the kid in it right you you want to see callan on there it says continues says callan and Shaw new show the first episode which will drop on friday will be called the fire in the rinks Callan recently got eyelid surgery is jokingly known to his fans as rinks because of this age in a teaser for the podcast the show alleged already had its own theme song including the lyrics of fire and the kid back up in the ring eyelids are heavy one can barely think blink sorry as of thursday afternoon the new project which cost a uh, five dollars a month on patreon has 846 patrons that's mad isn't it well done to them for that one Karen is not the first disgraced comedian to ask fans to pay for his content jesus christ in april lucy came to special 799 he also continued to tour before covid 19 pandemic so like i said man i think if you're a comedian in la you should be very worried about this woman amy kaufman i think she's really out she's really out to get everybody um or the scene in general and again i'm not too sure what the main goal is are they are they looking to take down joe rogan is it just them is it just a whole bevy because i remember reading somewhere that someone told me or someone said or someone i read somewhere that she was a stand-up comic herself so she might have a bit of an axe grind because she was basically feels like she was mistreated in the scene or in the industry so this might be part of the reason why she's going so hard in the paint at these guys but regardless i think if you're a comedian in la you really need to watch your p's and q's you really need to kind of have your head in the swivel and make sure that you you know treat women decently i guess if you're gonna go out and try and lay pipe as you're going around touring around the country because this lady is definitely sniffing out stories and trying to get people uh careers completely ruined for some so some legitimate reasons and maybe some some not legitimate reasons but we wait to see how this transpires anyway that's the excellent show episode number three five seven 
I think I'm really dark now at the moment. You can't see me. It's super, super dark. But hey, what can you do? Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time watching the show, please make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, of course, leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show on Patreon, please do. The link is down below. Patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O. Support the show on Patreon for as little as $1 a month and you can get my entire audio archive as well as this show in full audio audio hd three days ahead of everybody else but until then take care peace bye